Welcome to presentation number 13 in our series, Rereading Revelation, our upgrade of the series that we have done in the past. The title uh, today is uh, The Seven Trumpets and the Quest for History. And the text we will be focusing on is the same passage, same chapters that we had for the previous topic, just looking at the text of the seven trumpets or this first six trumpets. But these texts have been looked at or have been explored for information about history. And that has been such a big uh, quest that I wish to take a time out, as it were, and look at what that resulted in. And this is not to weaken or to detract from the previous presentation, just to so that is said. And so here we have the seven trumpets of Revelation running from 8.2 to 11.19. And uh, through chapter 9, the first six trumpets, then uh, I have this topic here that we will do today. Uh, same passage, and then the intermission that runs, covers chapters 10 and 11, most of 11. Chapter 10 on mission, chapter 11 mostly on method, and then the seventh trumpet. So today, this is what we're doing, the trumpets and the quest for history. And just to position ourselves again here, and uh, this is the Bamberg Apocalypse. It is a thousand years old, just about. And you see the seven trumpets here. And just to remind you, what we <coughs> did conclude last time is that here we see in the Welcome Apocalypse, at the blowing of the first trumpet, right off the bat, we see a demonic reality coming into view, wreaking havoc in the world. Trumpets as expose of demonic activity. That's what we did last time. And in the trumpet sequence, in the fifth trumpet, the star that has fallen from heaven is named in chapter 9, verse 11. His name is Apollyon, or in Hebrew, Abaddon, and in English, destroyer. And this is the land of Apollyon that comes to view in the book of Revelation, in the trumpet sequence in the book of Revelation. And <clears throat> you see then a blighted world, damage to the world, it is in Revelation, in the trumpet sequence, materialized, but it is obviously also trying to, to picture or primarily intending to picture a spiritual reality, the damage that is done in the area of, uh, uh, in the domain or in the realm of spirituality. But this is Anselm Kiefer, the German artist, this is called Five Years, Fimfiara, uh, this depiction here. And he doesn't need to tell me what he is depicting. At least I see him depicting a blighted world, you know, and this is a post-World War II uh, depiction. So the trumpets, if you wish to look at it in a material sense, historical material sense, then I will say the trump in the trumpets, no calamity is left behind. All the worst calamities are there. There is a representational adequacy to the terms in Revelation to accommodate whatever calamity uh, you wish, and especially those that have clear demonic overtones. And I owe this illustration to Jared Wright, who made it for me at my request. Uh, and this, of course, is the arrival ramp at Birkenau, and you see who is coming here. And this is an image from the 20th century. And <clears throat> here, 
we are still no calamity left behind. And you see this one too. This is Hiroshima and the reality of nuclear weapons that actually have the capacity to blight the world into oblivion. So we are, uh, it's not contrived of me to mention these, even though I do think that we should give preference to the spiritual uh, realities. <clears throat> so just two specifics here before we go into the quest for history part. In our text, in Revelation 9.19, there is an organ of interest. <clears throat> we read that the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they inflict harm. So the organ of interest here is the mouth, clearly, in a sort of modern way. What comes out of that mouth? The teachings, the view, the theology, as it were, that comes out from here. And then to go back to, uh, to this uh, tw 13th century illustration in the Trinity Apocalypse, this is the fifth and sixth trumpet with the horses and the heads here in the front and the tails that also have heads, this bizarre way of saying it or, or showing it. And representing this text with heads in the back and in the front and with the mouth. And I just, I made an even uh, bigger uh, magnification of this to show how strange it is, but also how intentional it is. That this is not someone who is on LSD. He is a thinking person. He wants to tell us something and he is using very strong and vivid images in order to, 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 uh, to do so. And of course, when you say <clears throat> that the, their tails are like serpents having heads and with them they inflict harm, you have to transition from these bizarre images, these bizarre representations to something more subtle, the story in the Garden of Eden, the serpent who speaks and represents God a certain way to inflict harm. This is the connection here. Uh, and we will have much more to say about that in, in coming uh, episodes. One more text, <clears throat> same thing, uh, same perspective, the fifth and sixth trumpet. Uh, and still, in a way, on the organ of interest. <clears throat> they were commissioned to torture them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings someone. This is torture, of course, torment. And in those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. And <clears throat> these are representations in the Bamberg Apocalypse. This is the uh, abyss, the bottomless pit, the star that fell from heaven, and then out comes smoke, and eventually they turn into horses, and these horses with, with uh, serpentine tails. Uh, and magnifying this, see again their faces, like human faces, women's hair, lion's teeth, uh, wings, uh, it is quite bizarre. It is a demonic reality. We concluded that. And here we have an even uh, larger uh, representation of the same thing. So notice what I did with the translation here. The usual translation is they were permitted. Uh, and that is a workable translation. But I am translating it, they were commissioned. Now you tell me, who commissioned it? Who is the acting subject here? Who is doing what? Who wishes to commission someone to torture people for five months and to not let them die? They would like to die, but you don't want to let them die. So this, in my view, is a clearly a demonic 
commissioning. But the demonic commissioning here, if you read it the way many people read it, they will say this is God doing it. And I will say this is, this is the ultimate subversion of the meaning of the trumpet messages in Revelation. When you attribute to God something that is so clearly demonic and is so, so speciously, so wickedly uh, orchestrated by the demonic. Now that would be something, wouldn't it, if this type of demonic activity actually succeeded in getting attributed to God. So this is where we are before we now go further. Yes, I had one more image here. This is again these horses in uh, the sixth uh, trumpet and they are killing a third of mankind. And there is a poisonous element here. It is the poison of a false view of God primarily, but it also has a material side to it. Okay, <clears throat> I want to feature two options here, two main options. And one is a view of history here, and the other one is history and reality. And so, well, let's say that if you read Revelation as history, and just strictly speaking, uh, uh, in a usual historical way, then you could say that there is an event and uh, a specific and well-defined event. You could say that the, each of the symbols of the trumpets point to a certain event. That is an option. That is one of the ways of, to read it. And then when you read it as history, you also should have chronology. There is a date, a timeline. Someone has said that chronology is the backbone of history. And I don't disagree with that. I agree with that. So then people will say, well, these symbols point to a specific event and there is a date to go with it. <clears throat> and then third point, this also looking at the symbols and, and their relation to history, there is a certain meaning, a lesson, and there could even be a theological lesson. That is the, in, the, in the column of history. Now, in a column that I would recommend as a probably better way of looking at this. It is reality that is depicted in the trumpet sequence. Yes, history too, but not history na narrowly conceived. It's reality. So here is the way I would describe that. There is a reality in our existence. The reality of unseen non-human forces that demands attention from heaven's point of view. So especially those things we don't see, especially what lies behind whatever happens on the surface of history. That is what we want to know more about or what heaven wants us to know more about. And in this conception, there is no date, but there is evidence it's not like you come with nothing. There is evidence in history, in, our, in, in the way things have, what, what has happened. The reality that demands attention is not confined to dates. It's not confinable. It is not so easy to categorize it. And then there is a certain meaning and a lesson and yes, theological meaning and the meanings in these in this last one, they are not necessarily the same. So when you look at <clears throat> these themes or, or these passages and you think, well, let's see what what does it mean in historical terms? We talked in <clears throat> one of our earliest presentations about three schools of thought, preterism, they look to the past. They think that the story that is told is the history of the recent past, first century history mostly. And then we said that there is a futurist school that commands or has the biggest market share today in the United States. 
And the futurist thinks that the revelation speaks about the distant future. So this is the history of the distant future. Usually the history happening right at the time of the person who interprets it. The, that is to say, now, current events. And then you have what is called historicism, that thinks that we see history from the present to the end of time. So we are here at the first century and looking till the end of time, that is historicism claiming a rather comprehensive view of history. So I'm not going to <clears throat> do all of these. I'm just going to make uh, concentrate on the historicist uh, approach to these texts and evaluate them and tell a little more background about that. So when you think about the seven trumpets and history in a historicist paradigm, there is a figure here, an expositor who died in 1903, who wrote very influential books about Daniel, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And he had a very pointed understanding of what you are seeing in the trumpet sequence. I call this the old view, the old historicism. He says that the first trumpet points to the Goths, the barbarian invasions in the Roman Empire in the third, fourth, fifth century. And the second trumpet, that's the Vandals, almost the same time, another barbarian invasion. The third one is the Huns. The Huns, you can think of a country called Hungary. Hungary is related to the Huns, Mongols who came and settled in Europe. And then you have the fourth trumpet, another barbarian invasion. So you have four barbarian movements here. Uh, uh, attacking the Roman Empire, that's the fourth trumpet. Very specific, very bold propositions for what these trumpets mean in historical terms. Then you have the fifth trumpet. Uh, Uriah Smith will call it the Saracens, but they are the Arabs. It's the rise of Islam that is depicted. And the sixth trumpet, those are Ottoman Turks, but they also, both of these together, point to Islam. Those are the, the bizarre images of the fifth and sixth trumpet point to Islam in the old view. Then in around 1970, someone in the same faith community as Uriah Smith, looking at Uriah Smith's interpretation, decided that some of the things that had been uh, proposed and defended and argued here did not seem tenable anymore. So we got a new view, what I will call new historicism. The first trumpet is the fall of Jerusalem. It's quite different from what you see here if you compare them. The second trumpet is the fall of Rome. The third one is the Dark Ages. Islam somehow disappeared. And <clears throat> number four is the age of reason. And number five and six, the two trumpets that are described in most detail, that's the secular ideologies from the 18th century until now. So I want to subject these views to some of the questions I uh, featured earlier. <clears throat> so here is the history part of it. First, that there is an event, a specific and well-defined event. So what does old historicism, the historicism of uh, Uriah Smith and his faith community, what does it say about specific events? Well, we saw that already. The Goths in the first trumpet, the Vandals in the second trumpet, the Huns in the third, the Heruli, or another Gothic uh, uh, movement or barbarian uh, group coming in trumpet four, then the Saracens, the Arabs with Muhammad, and the Ottoman Turks here as a continuation of that. That's old historicism in terms of the specific fulfillments, the, what we call the reference for the symbols in the trumpets. 
And then we ask, <coughs> what about the chronology? Is the, there should be a date, a timeline, and chronology is considered important. Do we have that? Oh, yes, we have that too. And we have one of the leading figures among the gods, and we have some dates for that. Those dates are not completely hard and fast nailed, but they are uh, dates that that uh, that occur or that are featured. The Vandals, they also have a leading figure and a certain date. The Huns, Attila the Hun, we have heard about Attila the Hun, and I have heard that people still call their children Attila. I don't think I want to call my children Attila, but <clears throat> be that as it may, we have <clears throat> different tastes in terms of uh, stuff like that. So here, Similar, this is the 4th and 5th centuries, all of this. The 4th trumpet, the Heruli, and now getting into the 6th century uh, uh, somewhat. And the Roman Empire is now falling apart. And then something else will come, the Saracens. And we have dates. And here the dates in the historicist scheme become quite specific. Quite, quite precise here, going from around this time. And the date 1449 is a date defended in the old historicist scheme. And even another time period, the five months of torture in the fifth trumpet, uh, that's in the historicist scheme made to be a period running from 1299 to 1449. And then <clears throat> we have the Ottoman Turks, and again, very bold temporal specifics, 1449 to 1840, to August 11, 1840. That's how specific it is in the old historicist scheme. There is a certain meaning, I said also, a lesson, including a theological lesson, well, how does that work in the old historicism? Not that much theology. It reports and describes, but it doesn't pursue meaning very much. You see page after page after page of history in the books of Uriah Smith, but he doesn't, he doesn't bother about the meaning. He just tells it, thinks this is it, here you go. That's quite interesting. And here is one striking feature. This approach does not explore the Old Testament echoes in Revelation. The Revelation echoes the Old Testament almost in every verse. But you don't get, you wouldn't know if you read Uriah Smith. There is only one book in the Old Testament that he is interested in, and that's the book of Daniel because he tends to approach Revelation as though it is a second volume, second edition of the book of Daniel. And then, <clears throat> like I said, uh, that or I didn't say this yet, I'm saying it now, that this view pays little or no attention to the theme of cosmic conflict. I'm not, I'm not unfair when I say that. It is a descriptive and predictive uh, approach, not an explanatory approach. That's as fairly fair a description as I am able to give of that old historicism. I want to look at some specifics. We're going to look at the fifth trumpet in the old historicist scheme. And here is the fifth trumpet as it is represented in the welcome apocalypse, smoke coming out from the bottomless pit. And this figure on the top of the column of smoke and all these bizarre creatures coming out from here. So here, <clears throat> Uriah Smith will quote a historian called Alexander Keith. And this is what Keith is saying and Smith approving. There is scarce, scarcely so uniform an agreement among interpreters concerning any other part of the apocalypse as respecting the application of the fifth and sixth trumpets, or the first and second woes. He's saying everybody agrees with this. 
This is what everyone thinks about these symbols. This is what they point to. Everyone knows that or agrees with that to this, that it points to the Saracens, the Arabs and the Turks. It is so obvious that it can scarcely be misunderstood. Well, let me tell you something or tell them something. It isn't obvious. That is a claim that is vastly exceeding the evidence for saying that it is obvious. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but that's how blunt one ought to be on that point. Instead of a verse or two designating each, the whole of the ninth chapter of Revelation, equal portions, is occupied with the description of both the Saracens and the Ottoman Turks. <clears throat> so, uh, yes, so let me, I have one more and continuation here. And now he is, I don't know if he's still quoting Alexander Keith or what, but this is how he characterizes Islam and, and the movement here. I have as headline here, here interpretation and representation. And then I put in parenthesis, misrepresentation. Is the interpretation a correct representation? Or are you actually misrepresenting something when you talk like this? Here is the characterization. Like the noxious and even deadly vapors, which the winds, particularly from the Southwest, diffuse in Arabia. Ma Mahometanism, Mohammedanism or Islam, spread from hence its pestilential influence, arose as suddenly and spread as widely as smoke arising out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace. Such is a suitable symbol of the religion of Mahomet, of itself, or as compared with the pure light of the gospel of Jesus. It was not like the latter, a light from heaven, but a smoke out of the bottomless pit. Now, these texts echo the Old Testament in a big way, as we saw. That doesn't concern uh, our interpreter here in the least. So, <clears throat> what is our comment here? Well, I want to make a comment uh, and use <coughs> Peter Brown, who is... Uh, uh, today, still the world's foremost expert on this period, a period that now call, is called late antiquity, that reaches into the right time of the rise of Islam. And where Uriah Smith will say this religion was a pestilential influence, this is what Peter Brown will say. Whatever he may have thought about the Christian church, the Muslim guided his conduct by exactly the same considerations as did any Christian or Jew throughout the Fertile Crescent. He doesn't think that the Muslims are so obviously inferior. That's what Peter Brown is telling you. He too was a God-fearer. He too had to face the terrible choice of the Last Judgment infallibly revealed to him in a sacred book. He too must think of it day and night. He is actually thinking that the Muslims were capable of piety, that there was an element of interiority in Islam that simply does not exist in Uriah Smith's view of, these, of this religion. So if we apply uh, Peter Brown's view to this interpretation, we will say that we have been served an interpretation that actually misrepresents Islam in a way. That's really what, what we are seeing. <clears throat> so uh, let's do the sixth trumpet now in the old historicist paradigm. And here is the text. <clears throat> the sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So this is the text, and here is Uriah Smith's interpretation. 
These are the four principal sultanies of which the Ottoman Empire was composed, located in the country watered by the Euphrates. This is really narrow, really pinpointing it, but that's what old historicism served and served successfully for quite some time. And then we have this detail here in the next verse. The number of the troops of cav uh, cavalry was 200 million. I heard their number. So here we have a horde that I presented as a demonic horde uh, in our previous presentation. Here is what old historicism will say. Some think 200 million to mean all the Turkish warriors during the 391 years and 15 days of their triumph over the Greeks. Well, you have to do your arithmetic and work hard at it to get up to 200 million, even if you extend it over 300 and, or 400 years. Nothing can be affirmed on this point. Here is just hedging and it is nothing at all essential. It is quite essential if Revelation depicts a demonic reality coming to finality and you trivialize it with a referent as, as uh, uh, narrow or as small as this one. <clears throat> okay, we ha I have two more. I will uh, show you two more and then we will uh, go to new historicism. <clears throat> so here, Revelation symbols and Turkish uniforms. Uh, the first part of this description, this is in Revelation 9, uh, uh, verses 13 through 19. The first part of this description may have reference to the appearance of these horsemen as Ottoman Turks. Fire representing a color uh, stands for red, uh, as red as fire, being a frequent term of expression, jacinth or hyacinth, for blue and brimstone for yellow. These colors greatly predominated in the dress of these warriors so that the description according to this view would be accurately met in the Turkish uniform which was composed largely of red or scarlet, blue and yellow. In my pictorial representations here you see rather grotesque images, rather bizarre, rather uh, just horrible stuff in the Deuce Apocalypse and here in the Trinity Apocalypse. But it is colorful here too. But the fire and brimstone is really quite, you know, the text is stretching to describe something that is just awful, awful. But here are the Turkish uniforms and I think they're pretty cheerful. These are from the time when Uriah Smith uh, wrote his uh, his interpretation, uh, or just before that. So these bizarre symbols in Revelation are now, we are asked to believe that they are uh, descriptions of Turkish uniforms. And here is it another one, quite stately, and, uh, and this is one uh, uh, then mounted on a horse. <clears throat> one more. Here, <clears throat> sixth trumpet in the old historicism. The heads of the horses <clears throat> were in appearance as the heads of lions to denote their strength, courage, and fierceness. While the last part of the verse undoubtedly, undoubtedly has reference to the use of gunpowder and firearms for purposes of war, which were then but recently introduced. So now we have gunpowder represented in the trumpet sequence. This is <clears throat> Albrecht Dürer's representation of the seven trumpets, amazing stuff, bizarre stuff. And obviously he too is trying to capture a demonic reality. And here we have the Turkish soldiers with their guns, a quite a tame referent for what is depicted in, the, in these, uh, in these uh, symbols. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> we go to new historicism. Again, the history part. There is an event, a specific and well-defined event, 
will new historicism give us that? It will. It will say first trumpet, fall of Jerusalem, second fall of Rome. The third one is the Dark Ages. The fourth one is the Age of Reason. The fifth one is <clears throat> the age of secular ideology reaching down to our time. Quite a different landscape from the previous one. <clears throat> then <clears throat> we asked if there is a date, a timeline, chronology to go with it. And there is here AD 70, here AD 476, when the last emperor of Rome falls, sort of. Here, the Dark Ages, from about that time, I put a date here, 15, 1543. 1543 is the date of Copernicus, when he discovers that the Earth revolves around the Sun. And it is also the date of Andreas Vesalius, who was a young Italian anatomist, who wrote an, a, an atomic atlas of the human body that mark the beginning of a new era. So the Dark Ages is now over, we could say. Then we get the Age of Reason, according to New Historicism, and we get the Age of Secular Ideology here in the Fifth and Sixth Trumpet. And we want to look at them uh, in more detail. Here <clears throat> also there is a certain meaning, a lesson, including a theological lesson. And the New Historicism is far more forthcoming when it comes to theological meaning. The alleged meaning is given to us within a deuteronomic or deuteronomistic, that refers to the book of Deuteronomy uh, in the Old Testament. That is the meaning, it, the view of the covenant in that book, where if you disobey, God punishes you. So the theology of this New historicism is the theology of divine retribution. Does it explore Old Testament uh, text? Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, it does. It explores Old Testament echoes of Re in Revelation, not only the book of Daniel, but <clears throat> there are some limitations to the way it uses the Old Testament. And the limitation is its tendency to think that the book of Revelation has the same theological vision as the book of Deuteronomy. And there is also attention to the cosmic conflict, much more than in Uriah Smith, but this view concludes just like those who don't care about the cosmic conflict, all those other views that have no interest in the cosmic conflict, they have in common all these views that they see a message of divine retribution. All right, <clears throat> let's look at some of the specifics here. And here is the first trumpet again, uh, represented like this in the welcome apocalypse. Here is what <clears throat> one of the new uh, people belonging to the new historicist view, uh, I will I don't. I, I wish to represent it as as uh, as uh, fairly as I can. This is a commentary by Ranko Stefanovic. The biblical evidence leads one to conclude that the first trumpet blast portrays the consequences visited upon those who rejected and crucified Jesus and opposed the gospel. So they have something coming to them. The covenant curses. That's what is implied there. And then the specifics, if the first two trumpet sounds deal with the fall of the Jewish nation and the Roman Empire responsible for the death of Christ, then the scene of the blowing of the third trumpet has to do with the period of history following the fall of the Roman Empire. This period often referred to as the Dark Middle Ages. This is very different from the old historicists. Uh, interpretation and uh, the events here is first the fall of Jerusalem with <clears throat> represented in my illustration with a picture from the arch of Titus in, in Rome after he had conquered Jerusalem in AD 70 and then the fall of Rome and here are, is the imperial forum in Rome after Rome fell uh, yes <clears throat> that was the 
first three trumpets. I'm still doing new historicism, now the fourth trumpet. Next, <clears throat> the intellectual revolution of the Age of Enlightenment or the Age of Reason that characterized Europe from the 16th through the 18th centuries ended the rule of Christian faith over the Western mind. This suggests to me that you think that the rule of the Christian faith over the Western mind was a benign rule. Maybe he doesn't mean that, but I have a hunch that maybe he does. The new phenomenon rejected traditional religion and led to the outgrowth of rationalism, skepticism, humanism, and liberalism. Its final product was the birth of and rise of secularism. What we had in the symbols here in the fourth trumpet is the darkening of the sun and moon and stars and so on. <clears throat> and uh, here then, uh, what is depicted in the first, fourth trumpet, according to this interpretation, is the age of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we are now going to the fifth trumpet in the new historicism. <clears throat> <clears throat> the fifth trumpet refers to the spiritual condition in the secular world and the consequences of such conditions from the 18th century to our time. This is very firm, very confident way of saying this is what that symbol means. And uh, the oppressive rule of the church was replaced by the atheistic philosophy in various forms, such as deism, relativism, nihilism, rationalism, and communism. And here we have Karl Marx and the rise of communism, and we have nihilism, Nietzsche, who is the bad boy, of nihilists, <laughs> even though in my view he wasn't so bad. But this is what the fifth trumpet sees in, this, in these uh, symbols. And <clears throat> now for a composite view of the, in the new historicism of the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth trumpets. What is depicted, we are told, is rationalism, skepticism, humanism, liberalism, deism, relativism, nihilism, nationalism, and communism. That's a long list of isms. Very broad. Hardly any ism left out. And then you wonder, when you look at the claims like that and you see communism here and the Enlightenment here, you wonder <clears throat> about some isms that didn't make the list. How about colonialism? Why didn't colonialism make the list? Or racism, the slave trade? Or maybe even capitalism deserves to be criticized? Or in the 20th century, fascism? Why are these selected? Does it really represent this time? Is have we captured the reality to which those symbols point fairly, accurately? Or have we just started making up stuff? When you sit in certain religious communities, sequestered from the outside world, and you develop agendas that tell you a lot more about the time of the interpreter, so just again, why didn't these make the list? Or should I rather say that these lists, including this one, may not be the best idea for <clears throat> what we read about in the trumpets. <clears throat> so here again, we have the text here, and I'm not going to read all of it, just highlight the horses, the fire and sapphire and sulfur, the fire and smoke and sulfur, and then this one, my favorite verse here, the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they inflict harm. And we heard the serpent in the story in the beginning of the Bible here. What we get in New Historicism is this list of isms and a special focus on these ones here, deism, relativism, nihilism, nationalism, and communism, and some very bad isms didn't even make the list. That is a uh, problem here. <clears throat> so 
the person who writes this and gives us these interpretations, and I respect him and, and really think highly of him, but I do not agree with this way of reading the trumpets, that's for sure. And the smoke of the demonic abyss, he adds, may be observed, for in instance, in the various movements within Christianity that are promoting a religion based largely on emotions, which has taken the place of the religion of mind and conduct. Yet this demonic smoke can equally be observed in the widespread New Age movement and the growing activities of Islam. I mean, there is hardly anything left out. <laughs> and it seems a little trite, it seems a little trivial, it seems a little too much like a certain religious community in a sequestered space in the United States at the turn of the previous century. I say about this and also the preterist interpretations and the futurist interpretations that the symbols of the book of Revelation give us very big shoes. And you need to find a foot that is big enough to fill those shoes. And the foot proposed by preterism, futurism, and historicism is simply not big enough. That is a problem here. It simply isn't big enough. Text and history here in the fifth and sixth trumpet, the old view for that is Islam. The new view is this long list of isms here. And here I see my brothers, <coughs> past and present, shooting target and I do not see those arc arrows hitting the target. That is what my illustration is meant to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, depict. Just to add this up now, historicism, old and new in the trumpets. So there is an event, a specific and well-defined event in both schemes. They are different events, but they are specific and well-defined. Here is my criticism. The connection between symbol and event has proved elusive and largely unconvincing. That's one point. There is a date, a timeline. Chronology, again, is the backbone of, backbone of history. But the proposed dates are similarly elusive. And some of them are threatened by obsolescence their shelf life is running out. So one is always tempted to come with something new, something more recent. There is a certain meaning in these two views, a lesson, including a theological lesson. But here is my criticism here. Meaning has been elusive too. Everything here is elusive. And the emphasis on retribution in the new historicism is no improvement on the view it aspires to replace. The old historicism doesn't really get into that. It is very tentative or maybe even not interested in theology. But here we have a great interest in theology and the theology we got is the message of retribution. So here is historicism, old and new. Here is cosmic conflict as I see it in the book of Revelation and in the trumpet sequence. We see here a focus on historical events here. We have a focus here too, reality. Reality, the way things are. We have a theology here that emphasizes retribution, but here it emphasizes revelation of what the demonic side is doing. Here, God is the acting subject. Here, <laughs> Satan is the acting subject. That's quite a contrast. Here, we have Christ who initiates and makes it happen, sort of. Here, Christ is a revealer. And the chronology here is fixed and circumscribed. Here, it is open and comprehensive. And the diverging paths as you move through this book and I just hope I can convince someone to go with me uh, <clears throat> to this side here and not <clears throat> to uh, 
and not to this side. So the two options here on the, on this side, and this is part of it, certainly of the new historicism, is a message of retribution, specific historical events, or history and event-centered view. And I see in both of those historicisms a trivializing tendency, a foot that is too small for the shoe. Here, <laughs> the message is revelation. It is reality that comes to view. We are given insights into that reality and the demonic forces in, at, at work. And the language, there is a maximizing tendency in the language attempting to be picked for as a demonic reality. That's what we see. You cannot trivial, you must not trivialize it. <clears throat> I am reading a page or two, a page or a paragraph from my book here, <clears throat> from my commentary on the book of Revelation about the sixth trumpet. What leaps of memory and imagination, memory is the Old Testament, these horses have heads at both ends, in the front where there should be one, and in their tails, normally not a body part where a head would be expected. Their tails in turn are like serpents, <clears throat> with heads and mouths and all, like serpents. The verbal joint is high voltage, the dots connect to the serpent in Genesis. Uh, but it is best to reach Genesis by way of the ancient serpent in Revelation. The antagonist in the cosmic conflict may breathe fire and smoke and sulfur in Revelation's expose. He may acquire chameleon characteristics, locusts one day, scorpions another day, then horses, but he never lets go of his core identity. The sting of the serpent is related to its mouth, and the poison spewing from it is not snake or venom, but words. So these are depictions, and the demonic reality here is, is what is captured by these symbols. Okay, <clears throat> we have are moving to my conclusion. There is a reality. Now, you're looking at my own approach to this book. There is a reality, the reality of unseen non-human forces that demand urgent attention from heaven's point of view. And the bizarre hypercharged imagery and allusions to the Old Testament story of the fallen star. It's not nihilism, it's the devil. It is not this ideology or, or, the, or the Herulai. It is a demonic reality that you may find traces of in these movements and ideologies, but our image is bigger than that. There is no date. But there is evidence. The reality that demands attention is not confined to dates. And here, the aspiration of the historicist to make the text say more, that is, to have historical specificity, ends up saying much less. You wanted to say more. Yeah, what, what is the specific event? When you do that, you detract from the bigger agenda of the text. That's what I'm trying to say. There is a certain meaning, a lesson, including theological lessons. And here there is profound theological meaning, a message of revelation and not a message of divine retribution. <clears throat> One final illustration. <clears throat> Two, three years ago soon now, I went by train from Westerbork here in Holland to Sobibor. I stopped at many other places, but I also stopped at Sobibor in Poland. Sobibor is one of the extermination camps, one of the six extermination camps during the Nazi period. And here is my gripe with 
historicism or other projects for interpretation. That this is an event that didn't make the list. And I don't want to personalize it, but the person who proposed the new historicism in my faith community was from Holland. So he was in a good position to include something more and didn't. <clears throat> so here I am on the train from, so from Westerbork where the <clears throat> 105,000 Jews were during World War II transported to either Sobibor or Auschwitz for extermination. It takes three days and three nights to get there by train. When they arrived in Sobibor, they disembarked here in this <clears throat> where these train tracks are and they walked down this pathway here or something like it and they walked to their deaths within hours of arrival. So along this pathway there are these stones with the <clears throat> plaques of names on them of people who did arrive and met their end in this uh, at this time and <clears throat> this says in Dutch my beloved righteous family or Rechtward family David Abraham Glaser Esther Glaser she was born in 1894 and then the children Sarah Glaser born in 1926 she was uh, 17 when she died, Hetty Glaser born in 27, Frida Glaser born in 28, she would be 15, Abraham Glaser born in 32, he would be 11. All of them perished at Sobibor on the 2nd of July 1943. So I say to those who want to do historicism, if you want to do historicism, you have to make up your mind what you think is important. But you didn't let this event make the list. I don't think that the primary purpose of Revelation's trumpets is to say things about specific historical events, except once in a while when the demonic is so prominent, so conspicuous, that you should maybe include this one on your list, let go of secularism, do the extermination or do the Holocaust instead or, you know, let it replace you. This event didn't make the list. That is a maybe the second most important criticism I have. The most important criticism I have of the historicist scheme is that the text in the trumpet is depicting a demonic reality and spreading misrepresentations of God in the world. That's what the text wishes to give us. But there are also those images. We can't leave them out.